I'd just like to welcome everybody uh, today. It's, it's such a pleasure to co-host a uh, meeting with so many esteemed and learned guests and also a fantastic set of panelists. Uh, we're very pleased to be co-hosting uh, this webinar with ALT and we're delighted to be welcoming so many of their members. Uh, Nankunda and the ALT team have been instrumental in setting uh, this webinar up and we're looking forward to a, a long and fruitful partnership with them over the years to come. Uh, this discussion is just uh, the starting point of a number of webinars that we're running, not only in Africa, but across the rest of the world. We run them under the banner of Talk for Legal, and everyone is welcome wherever we may be speaking. Please follow us on LinkedIn and find out when the next webinar is happening. But today we focus on Africa, and we try to get to the bottom of why so much innovation is happening throughout the continent, how quickly legal professionals are reacting to legal tech and the tools that can help revolutionize their teams and their practice. I'm representing App for Legal, uh, a legal practice management software solution that is sitting in the middle of everything good that is happening in legal tech right now. We have been in private practice law firms and all in-house legal teams for over five years now, and we represent all lawyers, from small to large firms and from banks to manufacturing companies. Our solution has been designed by lawyers and every update that we've made over the last five years is because a lawyer has told us that is what is needed to happen. In the last 12 months, we've seen a, a massive period of hyper growth across the whole of the world. Uh, but one of our fastest growing regions has been Africa. Uh, we have now made financial investment into our infrastructure throughout Africa, and we see the growth potential to be enormous. Just a little background on me. I've been working with uh, law firms on sales and marketing strategies for a number of years, working with over 600 partners, at over 15 different law firms. And I've seen firsthand how technology has changed the way that lawyers run their really busy lives. The ultimate aim in everything I have done is how to maximize potential. Now with that for legal, I've found a solution that minimizes time wastage, organizes your matters, and most importantly, it saves you money through being efficient. At this stage, I'm going to hand over to Nankunda, uh, who will be moderating today's discussion, and will be able to introduce herself and elaborate more. Thank you, John, and thanks for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Nankunda Katangaza, and I'm the uh, co-founder of the African Law and Tech Network, also known as the Old Network. <clears throat> we at Alt are really pleased to be kicking this year off uh, with this event um, and revisiting the theme with which we actually started the Old Network back in 2017 which is legal tech and its adoption in the African legal sector, and in particular in law firms. <clears throat> it's an added pleasure to be partnering with App for Legal, who are new members of the network, and we are grateful to them for the idea of having these conversations together, um, and also for an opportunity to bring along some of our other old members to join us. So it's a bit of a reunion, really, Law Pavilion and KTA advocates that, who have been with Alt from the very beginning. And it's also great to meet a new friend, Lex Chambers from Rwanda. Um, when we created the Alt Network, um, my colleagues and I were responding to a question and an observation that we had heard repeatedly from lawyers and law firms across the continent. With technology disrupting so many sectors and industries, was it inevitable that the same would happen to legal services? And if so, how? Were lawyers doomed to extinction or were there new opportunities created for lawyers by technological innovation? Given the important role played by legal services in all aspects of a country's economic, social, political, and personal spheres, our view was that the latter was more likely. Um, little did we know then that a global event would radically change the way we work and live and drive many of those of us who work in the professional services sectors to our homes for months at a time. Some of us are actually still at home. So today's session is a rather timely one. We will be exploring the impact of the last year on innovation in legal tech on the continent and on the adoption and the likely prospects of accelerated digitization and digitalization of information and processes in African law firms. 
So I'm going to um, let me introduce our other panelists very briefly. Um, we have Okpe Olugasa, who is the MD and CEO of Law Pavilion, a Lagos-based legal tech provider that addresses the legal research needs of law firms, judiciary, and other institutions in the legal sector. Uh, we have Kenneth Mahanji, who is a managing partner at KTA Advocates Kampala, and Kenneth leads on their work on intellectual property and technology. KTA is a member firm of the of East African network of firms that specialize in IP known as Amani IP. And we also have Isaac Bizimurenmi, who is the founder and managing partner of Lex Chambers, which is a Kigali based law firm. Um, Isaac also heads the firm's corporate and commercial practice. So welcome to you all and thank you for joining us. You can read more about each of our speakers in the brochure that accompanies the webinar. Um, but for now, without any further ado, let's begin the discussion. So my first, uh, this is just very quick housekeeping. We're just going to have a bit of a conversation, ask various questions and, and hear from our speakers. Um, and then uh, we'll have uh, some time at the end for a Q&A with you, our delegates. So if you have any questions and any issues you want to raise, please use the Q&A um, in, the, in the Zoom app and put your questions to us throughout the to, throughout the session and we, we will cover them um, at the end. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with talking about some of the issues that face the legal industry in terms of efficiency, productivity and workload and, and the extent to which technology can and has already um, made an impact on those. I'm going to start off with um, uh, talking to Isaac. So Isaac, in your um, experience as a managing partner of a law firm, when it comes to efficiency, productivity, collaboration, communication, et cetera, what, so, what sort of problems would you say a typical lawyer faces? Thank you, uh, Nankunda. Um, well, the, there are issues that uh, the legal professionals do face um, in their practice. First of all, we need to understand the, for the efficiency of legal um, services, there are multiple players. A lawyer alone without the judiciary cannot do anything uh, um, uh, that is very, uh, you know, well, how can I say? There, there's no tangible difference that a, a lawyer alone can do without the participation of others. We are talking of the judiciary, we are talking of the prosecution, we are talking of um, uh, the, 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 the criminal investigation bodies. Um, so it needs uh, for, the, for the technology to make a fundamental change in terms of this and, and productivity and to reduce the workload. All these players have to be at the same, uh, at the same rate. But more importantly, the lawyers who manage who are custodian of judiciary, um, particularly the courts. Now, the, the challenge that we, uh, from my experience here in Rwanda that I've noted is that even though Rwanda um, is among the leading countries in Africa on, on, on IT infrastructure, but there is still a cap uh, capacity issues um, among the players that I talked about. We have judges, we have judges, we have lawyers who are over 50. And so they still, ha they still have this mindset, additional way of working. And so you find that uh, they are not responsive to the demands of technological responses that uh, requires for it to be efficient. Uh, so the point number one that I would say is that we, is an issue of capacity. And uh, then the other point I would say is also the mindset, which requires a time to, um, for people to, to change. Uh, I wouldn't think that, uh, I would not expect that everyone will change overnight. But Rwanda has been, Rwanda has had a government which advances um, technology 
were about at, at least effectively the last 10 years. But when you look at the, the response uh, in the legal sector, you find that it still faces uh, the challenges, capacities. I remember that in, the, in about 2010, um, the, the court, the judiciary had this, this booster um, that was, I think, called Africa, Africa Climate, Africa Investment Climate Facility, something like that. So it introduced recording equipment in the courts so that the, both the lawyers and the, the judges, whatever, they are, whatever the business in the courtroom should be recorded. But um, the lower courts complied and they were happy with it. But when it, uh, when it went to the Supreme Court where we had this uh, senior, both in the age and uh, inexperienced judges, uh, they couldn't cope up with it. And so basically that had to stall the whole project. The equipment were there, they are highly, ex um, uh, very expensive, but they could not work. So the issue of mindset is a, is a second, is the second uh, legal challenge that I would, I would mention that uh, limits the efficiency of technology uh, as well as the with, uh, of the IT. So without this, without the uh, responsive mindset and the capacities, then activity remains low, as you, as you would imagine. Uh, however, we have we have. Um, we have, what would I say, a non, an, um, like we have an issue of infrastructure, which is not related to, which is not related to the capacities and the mindset. So uh, this, the Rwanda has tried to, to invest in, in, in technology infrastructure. Uh, so right now, I think we are over 90% coverage with the, with the optic fiber. But uh, with that technology will not, even with the presence of infrastructure, as that it will not work when the equipment used are not responsive to the, to the infrastructure. So my experience is that I've seen that um, in the courts you find due to procurement procedures, uh, particularly the cost-based procurement. Do you find that uh, uh, those the suppliers supplying the computers uh, offering a low, a, low, a low prices would be mostly be preferred. But you find that these gadgets, they have low, um, you know, very small uh, processors, you know, all those that are required to speed up, um, uh, uh, you know, the use of technology in that sense. These days, since the, since the COVID started the last year, we've been having a, you know, online, online um, pleadings, online trials, both in the criminal and in civil matters. But you find that for a, a lawyer in his office has the best internet connection and has the best uh, a computer with high RAM and a good processor, but the court, the judge in the court has the other way around. So these, these are challenges that we find that are, I find that, that are facing the, the legal industry in terms of efficiency, productivity. And this then, when they fail, when technology fails because of those factors, then it, defers, it has to defer the trials, hence bringing up the workload. Um, how, with, all, with those challenges that I've said, I would say that Africa now um, is not an Africa that uh, I think I was born at the time. There is, we, it has a high pressure of youth that, uh, that are very minded uh, on technology. And this pressure really um, compels the government to respond to the to the technological need, not in the legal sector, but also in even uh, administrative uh, functions. 
uh, I would say that uh, presently, um, Africa is, as, as John stated earlier, Africa is a very promising continent in terms of technology. Uh, we have uh, population is, is a good um, population with high, high figures of youth. I think it's a very good uh, input. In, and also uh, even the governance, governance um, in Africa is positively changing and at a very fast rate. So they are more thinking of uh, what best they can offer to their population. Um, and I think technology is, is, uh, is among the, the fastest um, and the least on the top of the agenda of, of every African government. Um, we have examples- Isaac, sorry, I'm gonna cut you off for a minute because okay. we've got a number of questions. I just wanna sort of keep Thank the conversation you. going if that's okay with you, please. Thank you. So we'll, we'll get back to you because we've got some other things that we, we definitely want to cover with you. Um, and I actually wanted to take this to Kenneth um, because Kenneth, one of the things that Isaac raised was um, the, the gap between the judiciary's knowledge and use of technology and the lawyers and, and you know, in, in different layers. And I know that Kenneth, you do quite a bit of um, training of the judiciary and you spend quite a bit of your time in, in sort of talking to the judiciary about the use of tech and using uh, and how they can be better um, uh, build their own capacity. So Mike, what I, and we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, to follow on from that uh, thought, um, you, I imagine, would have been in a better position in terms of adapting to the pandemic's uh, requirements. And so I wonder if, if you feel that your firm was prepared for, for, for um, you know, moving indoors and that sort of thing. I know you were also moving offices at the same time. So how do you think that your firm re responded to that? Um, and to what extent was um, technology something that um, assisted with that? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question, Nankunda. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, uh, the listeners and viewers, wherever you are. I think first, before I answer the question, I just wanted to, I, I hope it's okay to condole with uh, my brothers and sisters in Tanzania over the loss of uh, their president. Uh, may he rest in peace. And uh, yeah, so I just want to thank you and Joe for putting this together. So to answer the question, I think it's good that I'm following from what Isaac had mentioned. If you don't have an ecosystem where all the players are actually uh, at the same level, then you will have issues. So for us in particular, uh, we were lucky that our farm was a, or is a more tech leaning farm. So we're already uh, employing or using many of the tools that are popular now. But it helped with, to have that mindset because as you mentioned, once COVID started and we had lockdown, and it was difficult or impossible in most, in most instances to be able to service clients uh, properly, to be able to go to the registries, to get things done. And uh, that's, well, that's why we're lawyers and that's why we're, we're paid. So that was a very big problem. And uh, as a result of that, we've seen so many law firms, not only in Uganda, but all over the world as well, uh, sadly close their doors and many lawyers as well out of business. So, what we're discussing is actually really timely in the sense that for every law firm, I do believe that adopting and using technology is no longer uh, something that is optional, it's something that is mandatory. And for us in particular, it helped uh, one, even using the ordinary social media platforms, because if you have uh, discussions over platforms like WhatsApp uh, or Telegram to discuss uh, internal matters, uh, to allocate work, to find out, how work is going, and then to also do the same with clients. Those tools, in my view, were, 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 are cheap in the sense that if you're looking at it from the economic sense, of course, we can have a wider discussion as to the social and you know, mental impact of using such platforms, but that is a separate discussion. But at least from the point of ensuring that, uh, that all the lawyers one discuss amongst themselves, discuss with each other and interact with the clients, that helped. And then we also have uh, a software, a platform where we scanned all our files, all our documents. And so anyone that is working on a matter will work on a matter based on a system, which we call a smart case. So that also really helped because I could be at home like I am now. And then 
I'd be able to access uh, any file that I want, be able to send a client an invoice, uh, be able to give a client an update. So that also really helped. And uh, uh, I, I would really strongly recommend you know, using apps, apps like that, using apps like uh, apps for legal for law firms to be able to make it easier for them to do work and also to be able to interact with clients. But as Isaac had mentioned, of course, then after COVID, now we also had uh, uh, proceedings going on in court, although albeit virtually, and you know there were still teething problems in the sense that although we also have very good internet infrastructure, it could be better, but at least we have good infrastructure. You find that some judicial officers either are not really tech adept, or even if they are, they have challenges uh, with some of their tools. So in Uganda, for example, last year or last year but one, our judiciary took the bold move of going digital that we, we initiated the electronic case information management system that would allow lawyers and uh, practitioners and judicial officers to be able to receive documents online and also to be able to serve documents online. Although that is yet to really get traction or yet to be rolled out across the board, but that really gave the backdrop to or gave a comfort to judicial officers to try and start hearing matters uh, virtually. We already had already having we already have infrastructure in place. One, with the law, we have our audio visual rules that allow court users to be able to have virtual proceedings online, especially in instances where it is impractical, for example, in criminal matters, to bring a suspect or an accused person to court. So really, that was the same infrastructure that was used. And then we saw in most instances as well, use of applications like Zoom as well. But the challenges are still with the users, you know, to be able to tell these uh, 60 plus guys, look, you can be able to get a Zoom application online. Uh, please accept these documents. But I am happy, as you mentioned, we have had trainings done to these judges. I actually have one scheduled for next week where we'll be training a court of appeal on handling electronic evidence. And, they, and we saw it in our presidential election petition as well, that uh, uh, everyone in Uganda was able to log on to the Zoom application to be able to listen and uh, contribute to the proceedings uh, in, uh, for, for anyone that was interested in our presidential election petition. So I do see a move forward in regards to the ecosystem, which is the judicial ecosystem or the legal ecosystem, embracing technology. But I, I, I still strongly feel that we need to have more conversations like this to see what are the challenges, because it, it is one thing, for example, to build roads and infrastructure, but it won't help if the people at the time are using horses. So, you know, horses, uh riding on uh on uh paved roads you know that may seem like a waste so with us as well we we'll spend all this money getting all this infrastructure uh, coming up with all these solutions and applications but as long as we don't have more judicial officers or more lawyers uh, understanding how to use these platforms or how best to fully utilize them then those will always remain problems thank you thanks kenneth um so it sounds to me like there's there's a sort of an open attitude in a lot of cases where lawyers are concerned, but even still we've had some casualties along the way. Um, but there are gaps higher up and across the, the sector that mean that some adoption in one place does not necessarily solve all the problems. So John, um, in terms of the challenges that you may have come across in terms of getting lawyers to adopt like legal tech and even you know adapt to it and, and add it to their offer what what are some of the challenges you've seen in your african context and even beyond actually yeah no, it, it, it's really interesting because kenneth actually raised a point there that that i'll bring up the biggest thing that we find uh is is the phrase we've always done it this way um and that is uh, an issue that many industries face but mainly uh the legal fraternity, which is that, uh, you know, lawyers have been around a, a lot longer than any tech solution, and they are embedded in the way that they work. So this is the way I've always done it. This is the way that I was taught at law school. This is the way that I have uh, have to do my work. I have to do it this way. I have to put my physical file into a filing cabinet. I have to give this to a junior. That has to happen. And the people that are, are really growing fast are the ones that, that challenge that. And the, the firms that, that we work with especially are, are challenging the norms because there are efficiencies to be had at every step of the way. Um, it, it's kind of important that law firms really channel their processes and make sure that any tech that they have 
works comfortably with the way that they work. It shouldn't be the tech that's driving the way that uh, the solution happens, but actually the other way around. So the client should be saying, this is the way my working process is at the moment, and I need a tech uh, solution that is going to enable me to work better, smarter, faster, harder. Ultimately, every, every tech solution is, is there with, with one uh, ultimate aim, which is how can I make my life easier? Um, and I, I feel for, for, for many of the people here today and on our panelists, because I live and breathe legal tech and every single day I'm seeing another article or another solution that promises this and promises that. So it, it's, it's a point of working out where your processes are, uh, not saying that we've always done it that way. The, the other thing to add in is I'm too busy. Um, which again is, is a standard for, for law firms especially, which is I simply don't have the time. Um, I don't have the time to implement. I don't have the resources in order to do that. So, and again, this is something that we've dealt with very heavily at App for Legal, which is making a process really simple, holding your hand during implementation, making sure that everybody is trained, everybody understands what the tech is gonna be doing, and everybody has a voice to make sure that it works in the way that they want it to work. Lovely. Thanks, John. I mean, I, I will ask you in a minute to say a little bit more about App for Legal specific um, services. Um, but I wanted to uh, raise the issue of cost for, for a number of law firms as a perception that technology is expensive and they won't be able to afford something that they can roll out for a whole firm. Um, and I'd like both you and Ope to comment on that. But Ope, I wanted to ask you a bit more about Law Pavilion because you know, you've been in the market for a long time and you're always being innovative and creative. Every time you turn around, there's a new Law Pavilion product. So your most recent WhatsApp um, legal research product. So same question to you. What do you see, have, what have been the barriers uh, in terms of lawyers adopting your legal research technology? Thank you very much, Nakuda. Um, from what we have seen here, I tend to just agree with all the previous speakers. One of the main challenges, one really has been the, in first the mindset of okay, this is how we've been doing this. And then, you know, usually when you introduce something new, th there's always that tendency to, to not just want to adopt it. So that mindset, but really from the lockdown, it's has changed a lot, even beyond and uh, before then. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, changes. There's been a lot of adoption that is really gaining traction. So in my, in my experience, I think adoption of technology um, within the legal space is, is becoming much better in Africa. It can be, of course, there's room for bigger improvement, but it's really getting much better, especially right here in Nigeria. Uh, the other thing really is also the issue of cost. And I know you also mentioned something about that. Now, for us also in Nigeria, it's the um, infrastructure. You know, those infrastructural um, deficiencies could be a major um, issue. But one thing I have learned is um, if the mindset changes, as long as there is a way and there's a will, there will always be a way. So now those are some of the things that we, we think the, um, the legal tech community needs to start looking at, okay, what are the challenges? How can we creatively solve these challenges you know, within, the, within the space we have? And I've seen a lot of improvement, really, and I'm just eager to see much more. Thanks, Okpe. Uh, I was at a conference not so long ago. Uh, actually, it was a long time ago because it was a live conference. And um, <laughs> somebody described the, the legal profession as the last medieval guild that was still around today, you know, and, and I think, you know, you've all alluded to this. It's just, it's just a known thing, isn't it? There's all people on the outside who are willing to change, but largely there's a sort of protectionist attitude and a view of not wanting to change anything because it's always been, and, you know, also it's a sort of fear of losing a bread and butter rather than thinking about, you know, the next thing and how you can make that, you know, you look at your processes and improve them. Um, and, and I think that actually does touch on what people are learning in law school and what people are coming out with. So you take some young people who are very tech savvy and completely happy with phones and computers and smartphones, then they go to law school and it's like they're just narrowed 
and they lose all their interest in tech savviness. And it's as if the technology is fine for personal things, but not fine for, for work things. So um, on that point, John, I'd like you, you've told us about your product being quite straightforward and simple and you help people through it. Tell us a little bit more about App for Legal. Yeah, no problem at all. App for Legal is a, a, a full solution, legal practice management, management software solution. It's fully customizable and it's modular in its design. The most important thing is actually just looking at the vast continent of Africa. The way that a law firm is working in Johannesburg is completely different to the way that a law firm is working in Rwanda, is working in Ghana, in Nigeria. Uh, we have to take that on board and we are uh, a solution that works for every single law firm, but also in-house legal teams. So of course, that's another completely different set of lawyers. Um, modular in its design means that we can customize it to exactly the way that law firms work. It is uh, corporate matters as well as litigation. Uh, App for Legal is uh, CRM and task management. It is a client portal where you can speak to your clients real time and collaborate together, which of course in this difficult pandemic period ha has been so hard. I, you know, I know of one particular law firm in Africa where they're delivering the post that's coming into the office by hand every single day to various different lawyers. You know, that's not the best of processes and actually collaboration can happen with a great tech solution. So the, the thing that we like to do is we sit down with all of our potential clients. We talk about the solution in its entirety before then understanding at first how that they want the solution to work for them. And then we work through a very easy implementation process, um, which again is run with every law firm that we work with. We provide full implementation and training. We're very transparent on costs, which again has been raised a few times already today. Everybody thinks that this digital transformation or this tech enablement is gonna take years and it's gonna cost me a fortune. As soon as you take those two things away, we're very transparent on our pricing. You just need to go to appforlegal.com. You'll be able to see the pricing there. In front, it's, it's uh, transparent in the extreme. Um, we like to make sure that legal teams have a system and a solution that is ultimately just gonna save them time, effort, and get them billing more and more organized so that they're not wasting any more time. Oh. Oops, yeah. thanks, John. Um, Ope, same question to you. Can you just talk us through a little bit uh, on Law Pavilion and uh, your legal research tools, but I'm particularly interested in your most recent um, one that you launched recently. Oh, okay, Th thank you, Nakunda. So yes, the Law Pavilion, um, let me start by saying that in our, our approach to the industry, to legal tech, is um, providing specific answers to law practice, to issues in, in law practice. So most of the times we go after, okay, these are the issues we are facing here in Africa, and then we try to address them. So um, initially, what we started with was we discovered that 50% of legal time is spent on research. And many of the, most of the questions we're hearing from law firms is um, how do I become more efficient? The, the industry is getting more competitive. So how can I do more with less time? No, we didn't um, they save less time. Then the issue of productivity, and that's a little bit more pronounced now when people have to work remotely, and you're not even sure whether everyone in the firm is doing um, what you want them to do. So now what Law Pavilion does, um, what we did initially was to start with legal research. We automated legal research. We, uh, we, we built database around that and then built a search engine so that in seconds you can have issues of law. But that was in the initial stage. We moved quickly to um, up in the ante and then we moved to legal analytics where, okay, we don't only give you the relevant authorities, but we give you if there are issues, um, if there are conflicting authorities, if there are exceptions, if there are um, history of each authority in the jurisprudence, especially here in Nigeria. And then, of course, um, annotation of the laws of the federation. But we moved a little further 
um, than that now, we also saw that we have infrastructural challenges in Nigeria and Israel, of course. So now that tells that that's why we introduced the WhatsApp version because following the trend so that a number of lawyers, even though yes, there are technological challenges, but everyone is on WhatsApp. So we just moved it to a to the platform where everyone is comfortable. So now that's what you but um, certainly we released that one that you can conduct your legal research on WhatsApp. And the, the uptake has been, I mean, has been impressive because those that couldn't afford that didn't have internet access now can just quickly conduct search on WhatsApp. And then we also um, certainly released one on inside in within Microsoft Word. So you have within your Microsoft Word, you can actually as a typing, you can bring conduct your legal research and put in templates. And these are the things. Um, we, we've been doing essentially to answer the question of efficiency within the system and the question of productivity, albeit in an affordable way, taking into consideration the technological challenges we have here in Africa. And um, I, I think it's been impressive. We will keep pushing further, and um, it, it, it's actually the, the system, is, sorry, the industry is really adopting it, and the traction is impressive. That's great. Thanks very much, Okpe. So Isaac, I'm going to ask you the next question. In light of what you've heard already and some of the products that people are already using, including yourself, um, how would you see the future, what the, what the African law firm is going to look like post COVID? What's your view of that? Uh, well, my, my, view, my view is that probably at this time, at this time there is, in, we, we cannot know how certain, um, the, the certain direction which we can predict gonna be. But what is sure is that, is that basically within the next two to three years, I'm looking at uh, probably more farms in Africa going more digital than before. Um, it's not only, there are a number of factors that are, that are going to contribute to that. Right now, uh, what COVID has taught us and what others are slowly learning is that now office, office can, uh, um, a, law, a law firm can be virtual, can be more virtual than a hybrid. So uh, when, when, when lawyers are thinking of uh, cutting costs, they'll be, thinking of going digital, maybe thinking of going for technology. So right now, as in, from my own perspective, I'm, I'm planning in the next, uh, the next one year, basically I think of hiring, having many associates from all over the world without necessarily being, uh, you know, be requiring them to come to my country where I have to meet visa, transport, accommodation issues, so I've, I've, I'm trying to appreciate the good deeds of the technology. And then with that, I'm thinking of reducing the space of my rent. So if uh, renting maybe how many, uh, 200 square meters, I'm going to cut them to 50. So now we have, we have, we have, we've got, um, we've got a good example in Kenya. Um, there's a, there's a, I think you know them, this, uh, the founder of uh, Hub. Linda, Linda explained to us how she started uh, in a virtual, setting up a, a virtual offer. And uh, she does not regret, she finds it very helpful. So I think that uh, what COVID has taught us is that our mind has to, to think faster on how we can live um, try to live on, on how we lived in, during lockdowns. During lockdowns, we did not cease to work as lawyers, but because of lockdown, we are forced, in our mind, we are forced to find ways, alternative ways, and, and technology was the first priority. So I'm thinking that very soon, we are going, uh, law firms are going to, to be, to, to come from analog to, you know, to, to digital age. I think that's what I can say. I, I just say, uh, before I think I end on that, in Rwanda just uh, last month on 1st of, on 1st of February, uh, the Supreme Court passed a case 
a judgment in which I would call is going to be a case law. In that judgment, the, it, was, uh, it was a requirement by the constitution that parliament requiring to sit to, 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 to sit in their plenary outside their designated buildings, they can, uh, they can seek Supreme Court approval. And what the Supreme Court did was to approve that now the parliament can meet uh, via technology. So I think this is, this is a case law that is going to be applied even in other, in other um, forms of law. It will require amendment of procedure, the law, rules of procedure, to require amendment of the law of evidence. So all these to, to be able to enable this kind of people work with the, the, the traditional way of face to face. I think that's what I can uh, simply say. Thank you, Isaac. So um, I'm, uh, it sounds to me like one of the things that you've, you've talked about is, is the choices and the flexibility that um, legal tech brings to a law firm when it's thinking ahead and planning ahead. Um, and indeed, as you're saying, you know, you could actually have an international offer uh, with associates from different places that don't actually have to be sitting in Tigali or in your office and you know you can provide services in different ways and I and I think that's very true and I really uh, applaud that that sort of approach. Um, Kenneth, I wanted to ask you kind of a similar a similar question in terms of um, that the choices and and the ability to do new and different things. How has can you just give us a bit more specific on on the ways in which any particular legal tech or digital additions that you have undertaken at KTA that have um, been uh, transformative for you, um, and especially what you're seeing in the sort of short, short to medium term post COVID kind of impacts in the in the broader sector in Kenya, so in Uganda, but also in terms of your Amani network across the three East African countries. Uh, thank you, Nakunda. I think for us, as I had uh, mentioned earlier, with, we, we have, we have uh, a platform which we call SmartCase, which allows us to access any document within the file remotely anywhere in the world, as long as you have a stable internet connection, at least. And so that really has transformed the way that we work in the sense that, uh, one, we have reduced the reliance on paper and have now uh, fully, as I said, em embraced digital in the sense that uh, if you have uh, any invoice or anything of the sort, even for clients, it's usually sent electronically from the system. If you are sending an update to a client, the norm in the past has been to write formal letters, which we really enjoyed because then, you know, we'd write all the, all the English that we know. But uh, now really just a short and succinct email is really what works. And our system is also really able to update a client even without having the input from the lawyer themselves. So once you, once you generate, once the lawyer generates an update, then the supervisor or the partner who is uh, uh, overseeing the matter will also get an update. And then in some instances, in certain instances, if the update is also for the client as well, the client will also receive an update. So that really has one made it made it easier for us to always keep in touch with our clients and always uh, because there's a, a risk especially if you're handling litigation matters that uh, because of the 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 lag between cases that sometimes you find you will talk to a litigation client maybe twice or thrice a year because that's when the matter is coming up but what how that has changed is now because uh, updates are are done weekly or at least and in, in the list monthly uh, whether it's from the lawyer themselves or from a business development uh, manager, the client themselves now will be able to get an update even when there is really nothing to update. And that is really important, that connection with, with the client. And then, of course, with other tools like Asana that assist with, with uh, organizing tasks, that also really has helped. Uh, and then, of course, the use of applications like Zoom or the rest. But I, I also really wouldn't want to paint a picture that, you know, with embracing all these things, everything is moving forward hunky-dory. I think with everything else, we also need to understand, especially from the discussions that we've been having uh, before with all the speakers regarding the mind shift change. 
uh, if I was to use another example uh, with uh, if you if you have a child and you put them in school early uh, and then you have another child who's put in school two years later the the honest understanding is that the child who's put in school early perhaps will have a leg up one advantage over one who joins later and that's what I think is happening now and that's the same discussion uh, that's happening in uh, in places like the US over reparations for example whether you know uh, uh, blacks who enslaved should be able to get reparations and why those particular discussions are important is that although we have all these systems in place we need to understand that culture is still a very very big issue so although technology has helped us be able to move forward and interact with our clients we still have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, having a Ugandan in particular since I'm speaking from Uganda uh, be able to uh, effectively handle a matter from home the same way that they'd handle it from their desk, you know, that's still something that, you know, we still have a lot to do to change uh, the mindset and push and change the culture. But as I mentioned, at least for us, the, the advantage we had was we're intentional about the people we're hiring and those are the people that had to be one check adept because we are a technology law firm. So uh, with, with us, it was a little easier doing that, but I do recognize that this is a very big problem. The culture is a big problem for many firms. And it's 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 one thing to discuss all the things that we're discussing, but we need to be uh, you know truthful and honest with ourselves that you know uh, this is something that will take a little bit more time to be able to, you know, to adopt because although COVID has allowed us to embrace all these tools, the truth is once the fear is gone, once life goes back to normal, kid you not, I, I strongly feel or believe or, that uh, people may go back to how they were doing things before. So I think there's still a lot to be done in ensuring that although we embrace all these techniques that have, you know, helped us, especially farms like ours, that uh, we still need to have a lot more sensitization for people to understand that this is the reason why we're using these tools. It's not because of COVID alone. It's not because you know of this particular problem that's happening right now. No, it's the understanding that technology will actually facilitate and smoothen your processes. Technology will allow you to interact with clients easier and faster. So once, so intention is one thing, but understanding is important. So intention and understanding are two things that I believe go hand in hand. And you know, it also helps that even, even when we're looking at things like love, if, if you love someone, intention is one thing, but understanding the person and being able, that's what will allow a relationship to flourish, for example. So using the same analogy really with the law, it's having the intention to be able to use technology, but the understanding why should you use technology, not to plug a problem or patch it up, but actually, if you have that understanding across the board, I do believe that that's what sets uh, a, a culture that will then go on from generation to generation. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. That's um, very well put. Um, in fact, you know, um, Ope alluded to this earlier, and he said um, the, the pandemic certainly accelerated the adoption of technology, but um, there isn't any sort of guarantee necessarily that people won't sort of resort to their old ways or to saying, well, you know, I spent a bit of money on that to, in order to work from home, but actually I'm just going to go back to, you know, hiring a, a lot of baby lawyers who I can pay a pittance to, to do that work anyway, you know? So, and, and actually, interestingly, we have a question in the Q and A, which I'm going to go to because it fits in with this conversation. Um, and our question is actually somebody I know, Michael Brady from Northern Ireland, who is saying that in England, Wales recently, the LCJ has tried to nudge lawyers back to in-person hearings. And his question is, how likely are the courts in Africa to embrace remote hearings going forward? Are the judges as keen on technology as the lawyers are? And I know we've covered that a little bit uh, in, the, in the beginning of this conversation about where the gaps are, but I, I think I'm just going to ask Ope if you have any thoughts on that, because obviously, uh, and, and actually there's a subsequent question, which is to do with courts, so I'll, I'll add it. Don't you think over-dependence on legal tech, uh, I see where this is going, will affect advocacy, which is the hallmark of a litigation lawyer? So that's, you know, we hear those kind of questions. Ope, do you have any thoughts on those? Yes, th th thank you, Nakunda. Um, so, true, I, I perfectly agree with what um, Kenneth has said earlier, that there's uh, this likelihood that because of pandemic, a lot of people moved out of panic. But then, as the pandemic recedes, there's tendency to want to go back to our old ways. But I will first quickly say something, that the future of legal practice, as we see it and as we interact with people, 
is that competition will increase. And that competition will likely not just increase um, within countries, it will increase internationally. So with the advent of APSA, for example, the competition will even increase Pan-Africa. And then there will likely be mergers across African states, law firms and all those ones. And then what will eventually play out is that um, law practice automation will be the differentiator. So you're going to see a law firm that boasts of 30, 50 lawyers, and then they are not able to churn out the same amount of work as a law firm that has just about five or 10 lawyers, because these ones are using tools that enable each person to operate like 10 people in the other firm. And these are differentiators we are going to see and the gap is going to really um, improve. But then the question is, are judges um, embracing remote hearings going forward? Some have. The infrastructural deficiencies are actually making some to be discouraged. But the infrastructure is fast, the infrastructure provision is fast changing as well. So you end up seeing that it's going to be a, even out of competition. You see that some judiciaries may not quickly embrace it, but by the time they see some other judiciaries doing the same thing, news will somehow filter around. You discover that you are antiquating yourself by not embracing technology. So I'm actually very certain that in the next two, three years now, and that's why I will keep pleading with the legal tech com um, community, we cannot waste this crisis. There is a big opportunity to leapfrog the industry into something much better that adopts technology much better. And I think that's what um, that, that's one of the reasons why we're having this, this discussion. And then over dependence on legal tech, will it affect advocacy? Absolutely not. But what I will say is advocacy as we knew it has changed and it has changed for good. It's a new normal. In fact, you see, I, I, was, I was discussing with someone this morning and I was wondering, even though I'm a tech person, and you know, when my colleagues have been asking for remote work before the pandemic, I was always saying that, no, I mean, how will I measure your productivity? How will I be sure you are delivering, you know, and all those, then the pandemic came and we all had to work remotely. But even after the lockdown, we refuse to open to physical um, resumption anymore. Why? Because we moved on. We have platforms that enable us. So I don't even need to run after anyone. Look, you do your work. There's a dashboard that actually takes it that I can see how you are doing. So it's about productivity. Now, the same way, if you do not rely on legal tech, you'll be doing things the old way and you cannot catch up. So you will not be able to hire the best minds because the best minds now, they rely on technology and they believe, look, your law firm should have to be technologically enabled for them to be able to opt to operate. Look, those are some of the things you're going to be losing out on if you don't um, move on legal tech. But then we're not saying legal tech will replace everything. So you cannot over depend, them, you can over depend on legal tech. It's just going to move your efficiency to a very high level. It's going to be a quantum leap. And um, that's why we're having these discussions. I'm really excited to it. Um, towards it and the next two three years is going to be a completely different landscape entirely i just want to add one more thing to what opie was saying because i loved it it's fantastic you know if you go back to that law firm that you were talking about with 10 people doing more actually i would say that with the tech that they operate if they're doing it well they will be a much faster moving law firm that actually hires more lawyers in the long run as they get more work and they're able to take on more people to actually uh, flourish rather than you know the, the 50 man law firm that's always done it in a certain way so actually i think that the tech can enable growth that employs more lawyers um, rather than hindering or thinking that at, at any stage that tech is going to uh, get rid of people's jobs or lawyers will become redundant actually the firm that adopts um, tech will be the firm that grows quicker uh, Nakunda, I don't know if I may just weigh in just quickly on what John and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, was saying. I, I actually I've been thinking about that question a lot uh, regarding whether tech maybe either uh, reduces advocacy or in some way perhaps affects advocacy. And again, I will perhaps just just briefly recap what I had mentioned before, because the worry is if you don't look at the culture, then if tech is adopted lock, stock and barrel without really going underneath and breaking down to the why, then I strongly believe that we do have a risk 
of affecting advocacy. And I see that now, even in my own law firm, in the sense that I'll ask a lawyer to go look up uh, a case. And the first place that I'll look for is looking for the case online. But we all know that although that the cases that are put online are intentionally uploaded online by someone. Now, there are several cases that, that, that don't get uh, uh, the chance, so to speak, to be uploaded online. Now, if a lawyer only knows that I, I can search for cases online without knowing that there's a library where you can be able to go and get that, then I strongly believe that ultimately the client is the one who will suffer. But so I, I, I still feel whenever we have this discussion that we need to still focus on people understanding why low tech is important not to do away with the traditional modes or methods of doing work. I think if we have the discussion along that line, we may lose ourselves in the discussion because if you eradicate or if you, if you replace every traditional method or way of doing work without understanding why, as I've said, there is, there is a chance that the future generations to come will lose all these other brilliant advocacy techniques that have been passed on you know, from generation to generation. And I do appreciate it and understand, especially with the Commonwealth system, that although we see this in movies a lot, the truth is that for any Commonwealth lawyer, if you're going to court, you will rely on the law and you'll find that the proceedings are, most, are in most instances boring, where you will rely on what you have pleaded in your pleadings, what you have submitted, rather than you going on the floor and speaking so passionately and convincing the judge just merely based on your charm and, uh, and, uh, you know, and the rest. So I do strongly feel that this discussion has to be hard or tempered in the sense that we need to look at things from both sides that we still need the traditional uh, ways of lawyering or of advocacy, but the technology is a facilitator to allow you to handle these traditional modes of advocacy in a smarter, faster, better way, rather than replacing them lock, stock and barrel. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, I think, you know, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and this is a question that comes up a lot. And I think it's to do with that misunderstanding that is not addressing the why and why would you use technology? There is no question that, you know, people and companies and corporates and governments will always have disputes and they, they have to be resolved in one way or the other. And unfortunately, sometimes they have to go to court and um, that is not going to disappear. However, if you have the means of researching faster, quicker, broader, that is a tool for you to be a better advocate. If you have a, the means of, of taking your, of representing your client online through a, an online court or whatever, and, and giving them faster access to justice, that's a better, that's a better outcome for, for your client. And that's one thing we haven't used the C word in this conversation yet today. We haven't talked about the client. And I think actually, because it's all about the clients. This is, you know, it's not just about the lawyer, it's about the clients. And what does that client, what does she want? What does she need? What is, what, you know, what, what are you there for? John, did you have anything you wanted to throw in there? No, well, it, it comes back to, which is really interesting because at the beginning of this discussion, uh, Nankunda, you asked me, you know, what, what are the issues that, that lawyers sort of face when, when they talk to us? What are their biggest concerns? And my first thing is that we've always done it this way is a phrase that you hear. Now, of course, in the client community is exactly the same. So, you know, my biggest uh, ask for all lawyers is that it's great that you adopt it, but if it's adopted with your clients in a meaningful way with good implementation, the tech will work so much better. Now, your tech provider has to give you the tools to make sure that everybody's there. It's not your job to sell the solution to your clients. Um, however, it's, it's part of your tech solution should be giving you all the tools that you need to say, we've always done it this way, but from tomorrow, we're going to do it that way. And I think that that's going to be part of the tech change um, and the enablement that's going to mean that success will happen for everybody. And, and we keep on talking about how cultures are so different, which is, you know, in a vast continent of Africa, uh, of course, everybody has to deal in a different way with their own client set. So um, that, that's kind of the most important thing here. Thank you. And of course, culture is, is 
is is global in terms of legal services and delivery and administration of justice as we had from our question from Michael about you know courts in the in England and Wales looking to go back to opening up and not necessarily thinking about how they might do things differently and carry on with an online court system. ADR, of course, is another area that we haven't even touched on, but again, where it'd be easier to kind of have um, uh, online solutions and that sort of thing, but ultimately access to justice and making sure that clients get their, you know, access to justice that is not too expensive, but that, that works for them is gonna be an interesting challenge. Um, I'm now going to ask a couple of questions that have come up on our Q&A, uh, and one is, do the speakers have any advice for younger associates on advocating, advocating for tech adoption within their own law firms and how they can be successful? Kenneth, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. I think um, that's a question that I would really love to answer because it's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, something that I discuss every day with my lawyers and with my students I actually had a class today just right before this and one of the this one of the things we're discussing I was teaching about patents and we're looking at them as solutions to technological problems and in this particular instance I think every single lawyer has to understand one uh, what we're talking about the why and the how now the two are important because if you look at the why you should adopt tech, as we mentioned, because it will make your work faster, it will make your work easier. And then of course, if you uh, do your work faster, if you do your work better and the client is happy, ultimately you're in good books with your employer, you're in good books with the client, you grow in the legal profession and you know success follows. So it's a whole wheel that has to be followed, but you need to be intentional first about understanding why you as a lawyer, you need to embrace these technology tools. Now the how, of course, ultimately, we also need to appreciate or understand that for most of us, we know the internet either just sending a WhatsApp, going on Facebook, or just having a Google search. But we, we, it's, it's difficult sometimes to get to know exactly where all these tools are, especially like apps like um, Apps for Legal. I think that's an initiative really that would be embraced not only you know uh, with by so many firms in Uganda, but by also by so many firms all over the world. So I think as a as a as a young lawyer, it is imperative and important for you to know where to access this information from. So signing up to networks like ALT is a sure way for you to be able to get access to this information and to know that there are apps like this that exist. Uh, uh, going online and coordinating with other lawyers in different jurisdictions also helps you to get you out of that box that you're in, in the jurisdiction that you operate in, to understand that this is how other lawyers in other jurisdictions are doing this and that. And then I think the most important thing is, you know, putting in the time, putting in the 10,000 hours, being able to not only when you download these applications, but using them and using them for what they're supposed to be used for. Because sometimes you find that you download, you download an application which has like, let's say 10 or 20 features that would help you. But then you find that you're focusing on one because you haven't taken the initiative to actually go and read the terms or actually find out exactly what the application does. So I think, as they say, uh, the, the old adage was that, you know, if you want to keep something from an African, you hide it in a book. So that's the same thing that applies here. If you want to keep something from a young lawyer, you hide it in tech. So in order for you to be able to, you know, to truly harness that, you need to be able to unpack it. And that requires you putting in the work to be able to understand why the application exists and understanding how it is going to help you in your work. I think that's really the best advice that I'll give. Pet, you wanted to say something on that? Okay, thank you very much. I think I just align with, uh, with, with Kenneth on that, really. Mm -hmm. You need to first find yourself in places where these topics are discussed. You need to understand the why. Don't just jump into it without knowing the intricacies. You need to understand, you need to do some research, you need to study. And one of the easier, easiest ways doing that is um, 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 what I say, attending webinars like this, um, look, deliberately look out for them. You can check them on LinkedIn. And one of the best ways I tend to join ALT Network because you'll be notified of such, web, um, of such webinars, but you need to understand it because I have seen a number of times where people go ahead into, oh, I would be everybody's going tech and then they went to buy tools, buy things, invest heavily 
in gadgets that they ended up not using because it's not suited or it's not suitable for their own practice. So you need to understand the whole space and then so and you need to um to, you, you, need, you need to understand what you want to do and then you can interrogate those tools and be sure it solves your problem. And then I also want to say this that it may not be a um, a one day event. We also digitization of digital transformation takes time. So you may not easily see the the um, the results immediately, but it's a consistent daily um, improvement in how you operate. And then in a matter of months, you look back and you are able to say, wow, I have moved extensively from where I was before now. But the starting point is getting to the community and doing research on that. Yeah, just adding on to that, Opie, because it's really interesting. I, I think that associates have, uh, they come from law schools and they have a very pragmatic approach as soon as they enter into a law firm. Uh, to, to rise above uh, other associates or junior partners or whoever within your law firm. If, if you were to look at uh, tech enablement and how it's going to aid the firm, doing some research, as everyone has said, uh, and then representing that research in why we should be doing uh, any tech solution that, that you think is the right one, will we'll make sure that your career goes that much faster in terms of that you care about the law firm that much and what you're doing in order to hopefully save time, effort and money, essentially. So I think a junior associate has so much to gain from looking at uh, tech solutions and then sort of talking through them to senior partners or managing partners. Thanks, John. You know, um, at the beginning of this conversation, I think uh, we were talking about sort of awareness raising and training, etc. <clears throat> and I did mention very quickly the legal education angle. And um, ho hopefully we, we, we have in plan a, a future webinar that's going to be looking at, you know, legal education, specifically the role of legal education in facilitating, you know, in, in, in churning out the lawyers of the future, if you like which is a really big um, issue. So Kenneth has talked to us about his training of judges and, um, and indeed students as well on this issue. And we've also, also got a, a very long question in, in the, in the Q&A, which uh, it's not that long actually, it's, it's very specifically about the Nigerian law school and how COVID-19 forced the school to embrace virtual classes. Um, um, but the issue of technology may be for the efficiency of the firm, but because clients are, are not educated and not interested in tech, um, that might affect the outcome of their cases. There's sort of two separate questions there. But Kenneth, I think you wanted to answer part of that question. Do you want to do yeah, that? Yeah, 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 sure. I, I think um, that was a really good question because again, it ties into everything that we're saying. If you don't uh, skill lawyers, if you don't skill the users of this tech, then ultimately the ecosystem will be one-sided in the sense that it's only just a few people and that the particular legal innovation will not be able to have the impact that it should have. So I strongly do think and feel that for lawyers in particular, but even going beyond lawyers, because we have only been given access to these technologies just recently, there is a need, at least for the future generation, for them to have access to these technologies from the get-go, from the time they start school and class, understanding that this is the internet, this is how you can be able to use it. It's not just for messaging your friends or this or this, but it's for teaching yourself all these things. And you know, for people like us, like uh, Nakunda, you and I have, have had several discussions about this uh, in the past, about personal development. I, I started meditating, doing all these things because I found all these tools online. So rather than have a physical teacher, I was able to have gurus and teachers from wherever they are, some of them are dead even, but I'm learning all these things because this is how you're supposed to be using the internet. But it's it's easier it's easier said than done if we, uh, the people that are influencing policy, don't have policies that actually teach uh, young people from when they are toddlers that you can use the internet for this purpose and for this purpose. So even with law schools for young lawyers, I strongly believe that for young lawyers at the bar, whether in Nigeria, whether in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Rwanda, it doesn't matter. But law schools should be able to teach young lawyers these, these, you know, these, 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 uh, these tricks, so to speak, because the truth is, it will be impractical to 
to ask a young lawyer who has just left school to come to the legal market and compete with a lawyer that's been here for 30, 40 years and has really established the name on the market. And this is something that young lawyers in my jurisdiction have asked me, and I hope I can use this this platform as, a, as an opportunity to answer that as well. Technology has allowed me to be who I am in the sense that I have prospered because I have embraced technology, but by understanding why I'm embracing technology. So I think every young lawyer needs to understand that as a, as a young lawyer, the cards or the uh, 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 life is already stacked against you in the sense that people already have a leg up. So in order for you to actually compete or even outcompete these people, technology gives you the avenue, first of all, since these are all new things, but because everyone in the world now is talking about technology. So there is, there is a need for technology lawyers, there's a need for intellectual property lawyers, but outside that as well, the, the, the lawyer who uses the technology and is able to work smarter will in every respect perhaps jump all the hurdles that the older lawyers had to face where you, ha you have to take 30 years of legal practice in order for your name to be known. Uh, for, for those of us that, are, that, that have embraced technology, but understanding again, why we're using the tools that we're using and using it the right way, that is a brilliant way for a young lawyer to be able to establish themselves without having to spend the time, the rigors, that uh, other lawyers had to go through. Because the other discussion that we don't have is about mental health. And sometimes because the, the, traditional, the, the traditional notion is that as a young lawyer, you need to get into office at 5 a.m. and live at midnight or one. But that compromises your mental health, that compromises your relationships with your family. Uh, so technology has the potential to do with all those things where you're able to still spend time with your families, able to do things that you want to do, but also move ahead in your career, move ahead in your law firm by embracing all these technologies that we're discussing. Thanks, Kenneth. Um, I also wanted to add that, in fact, because of um, the sort of fourth industrial revolution or digitization of across other industries, a lawyer who's more tech savvy will be a better lawyer to fintech companies, to edutech companies, to insure tech companies, to health techs, because they need legal advice, but they need a lawyer who understands what they're doing and why they're doing it. So if you come with a sort of old fashioned way of looking at things, you won't necessarily get it. Many of those um, industries and sectors are, are grappling with, with regulation or lack of appropriate legal environments in which they're operating, they hear of, of you know, governments passing laws that ban cryptocurrency, for example, or ban all sorts of activity because they don't understand it. And so the easiest thing for a regulator to do is to prohibit it and then wait till there's enough pressure. Now, it's lawyers who who help with creating the right environment, who write the legislation, who, who, who will um, have the interaction with the regulators about technology and what it's doing in terms of fintech, in terms of health tech. So... Um, Apart from anything else, it's it's basically the same thing as understanding your sector that you're working in and your clients. You know, being tech savvy makes you a better lawyer for the clients that you're trying to serve. Um, sorry. Can I just okay, yeah. put something in there too? Because it's important we take the clients into consideration, really. And um, what, what, what I, I, I say is that your digital transformation should... Um, take the needs of your client into consideration. So you also need to understand your clients. There's the, um, there's the general assumption that all your clients need is just to win their cases or get results. But it's not only that. A, a number of times, the way you even serve your clients also matters. In some cases, some clients just want to, they want prompt feedback, prompt responses to their, um, to their, to their, response, to their request. But even going further, something that you can give them exceptional service. And I really like giving example with Netflix that, okay, I, I watch movies, but Netflix looks at what I do, the kind of movies I watch, and then it recommends one for me. Now that same service can actually be taken into legal practice, wherein you have, you have something like Google Alerts that tells you about your client. If there's anything, any new thing or any news about your client, you get to know it and then you can position your service. You can position your service to even serve the client. With that, the client will know that, oh, okay, you are taking him with much more, um, as, as a one client, um, um, uh, as a special client one, and then you are able to even give more service. 
and have that client on retainership. So let's not look at digital transformation only in terms of how it helps me in court, but how it helps you to engage your clients. How easy is it for clients to access you? How much report do you get from clients and do you give your clients so that when you're sending them your invoice, they know, oh, you've been working consistently. Now you need tools to help you achieve that and accomplish that and monitor it on a continuous basis. And these are the things that digital transformation brings on the table. Thank you very much, Rukpe. Um, I'm going to ask all of you panelists uh, a sort of final question because I'm aware that we're nearly at the end. Um, and if anybody has another burning question they want to put in the Q&A, um, please go ahead. But this final question is really, what advice do you have for lawyers that are looking to digitally transform their practice using technology? Um, and I'm going to ask Isaac to kick off on that one, please. Yeah, I think I think that the the first thing is that the lawyer should develop the appetite for technology. And I would like to recommend all advice that uh, a law firm or a lawyer should just go for for technology because the other the other is, is it. First of all, and and identify what is technology serving you. Is it, is it in the client best or it is uh, you have found um, most, is, it, is it for your convenience or for the convenience of your clients or both of you? Then after that, when you do, when you do such an assessment, then you are, it is easier for you to determine, to make a determination that you are going digital. And uh, it is that determination that will give you resilience in terms of costs, in terms of uh, um, enduring with the client's attitude towards the technology, so that you become, you, you, you really gain patience because you understand what the technology is going to, is serving in terms of internal involved. So I think that the lawyers, or even including the, uh, the, the younger lawyers, First, they need to develop the appetite for the technology. And uh, the, what technology is for them, then I'm, I'm sure that they will have no option other, other than going for it. I, as I said earlier, I don't, I don't see our communities remaining at the same, at the, at the present level. My 12 year child, teaches me how to use my smartphone. So you can imagine that. So I, I, I can see what kind of, what kind of, uh, of my daughter is going to be in the next 10 years. She's not going to be using um, you know, traditional means, not at all. So the future to me is technology, irrespective of its uh, ills that comes. I don't want to believe or convince anyone that uh, uh, that every tool or system of working is perfect. Nothing that is perfect in this world. But you just have to, you just have to agree to, you know, to, to, uh, to change as the world changes. If you don't change with the world, then you'll be left behind. So today, we are in a digital age and we have to find it. If you're not, we'll be left behind. Thank you, Isaac. John, can I ask you the same question? What advice would you give to a lawyer trying to digitize, start thinking today. about digitizing? Yeah, look, start today is, is, is my biggest thing. Uh, look uh, at what interests you. Look at what uh, your firm or your practice area is lacking. Get demos, speak to people. We're so happy at App for Legal right now to run through a real working demo so that you can understand exactly what our tech does, how it's gonna help you, how it's gonna help your department, how it's gonna help your firm, how it's gonna help everybody. We love to give demos and I urge everybody who's, who's listening today to reach out through the website, fill in a form, start your free trials, look around, start to get interested and start to get uh, um, as much knowledge as you possibly can because uh, 
a lot of good is out there. There's also a lot of clutter. So it, it's important to uh, find the good stuff and avoid the clutter. Um, but start today because tomorrow you're going to be just as busy as you were yesterday. Thanks, John. Uh, Okpe? Okay, thank you, Nakuda. Um, I think I will quickly quote Didier Bonnet. He said, the only wrong move when it comes to digital transformation is not to make any move at all. It starts with the mind. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. You may make mistakes, that's not an issue. But the easy, first thing is to subscribe to newsletters. Subscribe to legal tech newsletters, be on platforms that discuss technology. Just find yourself, deliberately find yourself in that community. As events unfold, you will pick one thing or the other and then see how to implement them in your firm. And then the next thing is, I'm always quick to say that there's a difference between digitalization and digitization, but we, we, can't, <laughs> we can't talk much about that now, but you need to build your mind in that area. You need to research. And then as John has said, watch videos, watch demos, look at different options. And then as events unfold, you will find yourself even becoming a consultant in digital transformation because that's actually where legal practice is going into. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Akpe. Uh, Kenneth? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, Nakunda, you had already mentioned this before, but I strongly feel that people fear what they don't understand. And I've come to learn that with every, so fear brings perceptions and with every perception, there is a deception. So the perception is that legal tech, you know, is only for particular lawyers, is only for particular law firms, it's expensive, yada, 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 and all the rest. But if you actually look at the, the good or how much further you will advance if you actually embrace these tools, something like legal analytics. I think for international conferences that, that we go for, there's always this, uh, this uh, hurrah over international firms versus local firms and how international firms treat local firms. But the truth is that for most of the local firms, we don't pay attention to detail in the sense that we don't want to employ tools like legal analytics to be able to understand, look, this is an area of your practice, an area of your business that will help you perhaps be able to speak to your clients better. I like how Isaac analyzed uh, how he's using the legal uh, 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 tool in the sense that he wants now to go to his clients and conduct a survey to understand, okay, what are your challenges? How can I be able to assist you, be able to use this tool that I have, I have invested in for you? And that's a very good move because that shows that as Africans, we are now seeing the importance of paying attention to detail, the importance of breaking things down. Um, I know this may open, up, may open a can of worms or beef, uh, but if, if you're looking at, let's say, the, the discussion we have over a, over a meat diet vis-a-vis -a, -vis a plant based diet, I think now there's a lot of information now that shows that uh, plants have been sidelined for, for too long in the sense that they, were, they took away the gist of why, for example, you should eat your carrots, vegetables, you know, and the rest because of the propaganda that meat is the only source of these tools. So it's, just, so it's also really the same thing. The propaganda that, you know, that, that tech is only for a particular elite class and it's not for everyone. No, the truth is that if we're to operate internationally, if we're to globalize the way that global practice is supposed to be, we need to embrace legal tech, but we need to understand why we're embracing legal tech. And in that sense, we shall be using tools like legal analytics, using these, you know, these uh, forward thinking communications tools that all these companies are coming up with. And that way we're able to service our clients better. We're able to service uh, our, our communities better. But most importantly, and this is something that really excites me, and that's why I get up every morning to go to work, the possibility that I can be able to make a difference, especially with policy. What tech has done is to open up a whole new world in regards to advising governments. Look, that you know, uh, instead of charging OTT tax, for example, like in Uganda, why don't you do this? Um, focusing on regulating data protection, these are the reasons why. So as a lawyer, for me, I'm really interested in those things, and when, uh, with you know, with the few years that I have on this earth, I'm standing in I'm standing in front of judges of the Supreme Court, training them, and and letting them know what the law says on taking electronic evidence. I'm really proud of that. But I could not have done that if I had not opened my eyes and embraced technology and seen it for what it is. So my advice to every law firm, every lawyer, embrace technology, but the way it's supposed to be embraced. Once you do that, 
we shall compete and even outcompete the people that have been taking these jobs from us or moving further from us. Thank you. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we have come to the end of our time today and our webinar. Fantastic discussion. I mean, we still have some questions that have been popping into the Q and A, um, and and I think it's you know we've covered most of the issues that are raised here. And I just want to say really that 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 little theme of technology taking our work away from us. What will we be as lawyers if we don't have books and big offices and and that sort of thing, and 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 not really thinking about you it gives you the choice about whether you want to have big books and big offices using technology means you can decide if you really need those things and what you need them for so um I i'm really grateful to all of you i'm really grateful app for legal thank you so much it's been such a pleasure to do this with you guys thank you very much okpe and law pavilion and all your innovation it's always an inspiration and it's wonderful to be involved always with you kenneth thank you so much for your time as always isaac pleasure to meet you and well done with being so creative and innovative and i'm sure you'll be successful with your plans for client engagements we will as the old network take on the the you know ongoing challenge and and pleasure of facilitating these conversations because that's what we started and that's why we we're here to bring more and more people dealing with legal tech and law and tech um on the continent of africa and and always having these multi-jurisdictional conversations which is what what we're there for so thank you so much for joining us today and um i wish you all a very good um afternoon and the rest of the day thank you everybody and thank you Nancy. pleasure